You're watching ADTV. Friends, welcome back to our fifth meeting of the Secrets of the Ages, the coming cosmic Christ. Well, this lecture pretty much is going to look at the New Age movement. And but before we really get into this, I thought it might be good to see some of the, the big movers and shakers, if you will, with the New Age movement. And this man you see on the screen is he's passed away now, but he was one of the biggest. Uh, proponents of the New Age movement, and his name was Teilhard de Chardin. And uh, de Chardin, basically, this is actually a little commentary about him, and it says here, Teilhard dreamed of humanity merging into God, and each realizing his own Godhood at the Omega Point. This belief has inspired many of today's New Age leaders. In fact, Chardin is one of the most frequently quoted writers by leading New Age occultist. And, and it's interesting to note, just for, for your interest's sake, that Teilhard de Chardin happened also to be a Jesuit priest, um, which isn't really a big surprise since we've already looked at um, that organization. Here's an interesting statement by de Chardin. He says here, speaking about the universal Christ, a general convergence of religions upon a universal Christ who satisfies them all. Interesting. That seems to me the only possible conversion of the world and the only form in which a religion of the future can be conceived. So Mr. Chardin teaches, or excuse me, Mr. de Chardin teaches, or taught, that we must have a universal Christ that satisfies the entirety of the world religions. Because from his standpoint, that is the only way peace can reign on this earth. But I have a question tonight, friends. Is this universal Christ or this cosmic Christ, is this the historical Jesus Christ of the Bible? Yes or no? No. It is a different Christ. It is a, how do you say, a masquerade, if you will, of the real Jesus Christ. So here is an, another interesting group just for your um, knowledge. This is called, the, these are called the wandering bishops. These are very prominent bishops that are kind of, well actually not prominent in the fact they're in your face, but they're, they exist and they are within the Roman Catholic system. And there you see the occult symbols all over their, their headdress and their regalia there. And um, yeah, they're, they're very prominent in the New Age actually. Now, before we really launch this evening, I need to ask another question. That is, where did the New Age movement begin? Is it actually a new movement? Well, actually, it's not. It's very old. Let's take a look at it. The beginning of it, way back in Genesis chapter 3. Notice with me what the Bible says. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Is it so that God has said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? This is, uh, this is the, the story in the Garden of Eden about how the devil came to our first parents, Adam and Eve. And many people like to, to laugh at this story and say, well, snakes can't talk and things like that. But the devil actually used the serpent as a medium to speak through. And the devil does the same thing today, doesn't he? He uses people to speak through. And he used animals. He used an animal way back in the Garden of Eden. Now, what was the first thing... If you notice the highlighted portion there, what was the very first thing that the serpent did to the woman there? He got her to question the authority of God's Word. And he does the very same thing to people today. The very first thing he will do, especially when you're, you're studying the Bible and you're, you're seeing new things perhaps you've never known before in the Bible, and you say, wow, that's, that's, that's really what it says. And then the devil will come to you in a, in a voice and say, Ah, uh, God doesn't really mean that. He means something else. He still does that today, but he'll, he'll do that in a very subtle way in your mind to try to get you to doubt God's 
word. Now let's continue reading and see what happens. Now the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. That's the last part there, even though you can't see it on the screen. So, this is interesting. The, the woman responds and says, God has said, we shall not eat of it, nor shall we what? Touch it. But if you read very carefully in your Bible, in Genesis chapter 2, you will discover that God never once told them not to touch it. He just said, don't eat from it. Her second mistake here was she added to what God had already said. God didn't say, don't touch it. Of course, God probably wouldn't want her to touch it anyway, but He didn't say that. He said not, not to eat of it. But this is what she said. God did say that if you eat from it, you're going to die. That's what God said. Now let's see how the serpent responds. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. Friends, this is the very first lie that the devil told our, for our family, our human family in the entire Bible. He told our first parents, if you eat from this tree, you will not surely die. And you know what, friends? Today, most of the religious world believes the lie of the devil. They believe it. They believe that when you die, you don't really die. You just keep on living in a different way, in a diff longer, and for eternity. That's what most of the religious world believes today. Verse 5 says, this is the uh, serpent continuing here, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And you see how the devil works here, friends? This is very interesting. Many times, think, many times people think the devil actually always just tells lies. But do you know if the devil just told lies all the time, who would believe him? No one would believe him, really. But he does something very interesting here. He tells a lie, but he also tells the truth too. So it's kind of hard to tell, right? He makes it a little bit harder to tell because he says, listen, you will know what good and evil is, and that's true. But would they become like, would they become gods? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So this is how the devil deceived. And then verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasing to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make wise, she took of its fruit and ate, she also gave to her husband with her, and he also ate. And of course, uh, since that disobedience took place in the Garden of Eden, this world has fallen. It's been under the subject of, of the devil. Um, and that was very tragic indeed. So basically, the New Age movement, as it started back in the, the uh, Garden of Eden, I don't really like to use the word New Age. It's kind of like the Old Age movement, right? <laughs> it started a long time ago. Basically, it's you will not die. So the way you live your life Everyone's going to go to the same place. Everyone's going to be with God one day. So let's not get so wrapped up in what religion is right and which is wrong. Let's just all love each other and be happy here. That's basically the, the whole thing of the New Age movement. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about some different individuals tonight. And um, just a few of them you may recognize. This lady here is named Make, May, uh, excuse me, Mary Baker Eddy. She was the founder of the Christian Science Movement and her book, Science and Health with the Scriptures, with Key to the Scriptures, was voted of 75 books by women whose words have changed the world by the USA, USA's Women's National Book Association. So she's looked up to by, by many people as, as, you know, very, very worthy author. Now let's take a few look, a few statements from her writings. She said on page 71 from her book, Science and Health with Key to the Scripture, she said, Evil has no reality. It is neither person, place, nor thing, but is simply a belief, an illusion of material sense. Um, I have to disagree with Miss Eddy's statement here because uh, when I watch the evening news, I see there's a lot of evil going on in the world today. That's, this, this is not the case. Evil is real. She's speaking about Jesus here, and she says, Jesus, the highest human corp corporeal concept of the divine idea, rebuking and destroying error and bringing to light man's immortality. Um, that's not what Jesus really did because Jesus didn't teach that we are, are immortal. Jesus said, like, like he said in the beginning, he said, if we dis disobey God, we will surely die. But here he's, she's saying that we all have immortality within us, which makes living holy, a holy life irrelevant, actually. Let us remember that harmonious and immortal man has existed forever. 
And that's what she said. And is that, is that in, in line with what the Bible says? Absolutely not. We were created in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden. We just read that. So, number one, we're not immortal. And number two, we have not existed forever. Another statement about death, an illusion, the lie of life in matter. Any material evidence of death is false, for it contradicts the spiritual fact of being. And what did God say in the Garden of Eden? You shall surely die. So Miss Eddy is definitely not teaching according to the Bible. Another statement, soul is the, the soul is the divine principle of man and never sins, hence the immortality of the soul. Now I'd like to take just a moment with you, if I can, to turn, turn with you. I didn't put this in the lecture tonight, but I just want to share with you one uh, verse in Genesis chapter 2 that describes this whole issue of the soul. And um, this evening, we're going to talk just briefly on this, but if you want more information, I've done a previous lecture that's already been recorded called um, The Secrets Beyond the Grave. You can get that at our website. And it's a whole lecture just on what happens after, the, after death and what happens beyond the grave. Genesis 2.7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Genesis 2 verse 7. So the Bible teaches that in the very beginning when, when man was in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve were there and God was there and God created them from the dust of the ground and breathed into the nostrils the, the breath of life that man became a living soul. Now is there a difference that it, when, if someone becomes a soul or if someone has a soul put inside of them? Is there a difference there? Yes. The Bible teaches that man became a soul. So it's interesting that many of these occultists, they always talk about the soul is immortal. But did you know there's 1,800 times the Bible mentions soul? That's a lot of times, 1,800. And not once does the Bible use the phrase immortal soul, one time in the totality of scriptures. But many times we'll hear even good Christian or so-called good Christian ministers stand up and they'll say, the immortality of the soul, but it's not found in the Bible at all. But you can see my other lecture if you want. It's called uh, Secrets Beyond the Grave. It's more in detail about that, but this if you're interested. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, the Mormons. Now, many of you probably know, have had visits from the Mormons, and you know, I like to say first off that I really appreciate the Mormons for a lot of things. I appreciate their willingness to go out, to, to share, to, to witness. I think it's very admirable. However, with all their zeal, I tend to disagree, uh, not tend to disagree, I do disagree with like 95% of their theology, and I'll show you why this evening. Um, here is one of the temples here. This one, I believe, is in Utah. Um, there is also, there are scattered throughout the United States and, and probably here in Canada as well. I'm not sure on that, but I know in the United States there are a lot of big cities. Um, here is one where the angel Moroni is standing on a globe with a trumpet. And the teaching is that when Jesus comes again, that this angel will become real and he will blow the trumpet. That's, 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 just, that's what they believe. And that could happen in a strange sense kind of way because they believe that Jesus is coming on the earth. And I'll show you in a moment that that can't be true from what the Bible says. The Bible says Jesus is coming from the sky. That's what God's Word says. But Mormonism teaches that He's going to be on the earth and everyone's going to come to Him, which a lot of other Christian groups believe too. Now here, there's two men on the screen you may have recognized. The one on your left there is Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. These are very, very important men in, in Mormonism. And um, it's interesting to note, and it almost sounds crazy, but both of these individuals were also Scottish Rite Freemasons. Very interesting. And now, let's take a look at some of them, some of their statements about them here. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Mormonism, its founder Joseph Smith was a high-level Freemason. His successor Brigham Young was also another high Freemason. According to the book Black Robe, Brigham Young was an intimate friend of Peter de Smit, one of the most powerful American Jesuits of the 19th century. Um, this is a book called Vatican Assassins, a very interesting book, very lengthy book, but it's very well documented. And um, wow, that's interesting that both of these individuals were high-level Freemasons who were friends with this very powerful Jesuit. So some of you may be aware already of some of the Mormon theology, but Joseph Smith receives golden plates from an angel called Moroni. 
And um, it's amazing that those plates can never, no one's ever found those plates. <laughs> you know, we don't know where those plates are, but evidently they're still somewhere. Um, here, this is uh, about uh, Joseph Smith here, it says, In the evening I received the first degree in Freemasonry in the Nauvoo Lodge. Assembled in my general business office, I was with the Masonic Lodge and rose to the sublime degree. That's actually the 32nd degree. So he was a high Freemason. He even said it himself. Um, here are some of the symbols and the signs of, the, of Freemason, not Freemasonry, but of Mormonism, which is actually very similar to Freemasonry if you look at them. The, the apron, the different hand signs, and, and so forth. And, and um, it's really a shame because a lot of the dear people, they are very good. I, I mean, I really appreciate their, their high regard for family values. I really believe in family values also. But you'll see those are some interesting little hand signs they do. And they also wear the apron just like Scottish Rite Freemasonry. Here is in Salt Lake City. You have the temple there. It's quite an exquisite building. If you look at it closely, you'll see all the Masonic signs on it. It's, that's what we looked at last night. You'll find the pentagrams, the, the crescent moon, and the sun, which is the male-female uh, deity. So you'll see all the same occult symbols, the eye, and the, there's the sun, and, and the circle, and all that. I mean, there's so many to look at. Then you have the Star of David, which we've already discussed, predates David for, for millennia. It's not, it has nothing to do with David. It came way before David. It's an occult symbol. Anyway, here's some other statements about Mormonism. Both Masonry and Mormonism refer to the Melchizedek priesthood. Now, those of you who have read your Bible, you'll recognize in Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, it speaks about Jesus being part of the Melchizedek priesthood. But it's interesting, in Scottish Rite Freemasonry and in Mormonism, they say that they are part of the Melchizedek priesthood. They are taking the place of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 5, 5 and verse 9 tells us, however, that Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but was called of God an high priest after the order of Melchizedek. But occultists, Mormons, and Masons glorify themselves and take on themselves the honor of priesthood that was given to Christ alone. This is in Kathy Burns' book, Masonic and Occult Symbols Illustrated. So it's pretty interesting that, that they would actually do that, to say that they are Christ. But it shouldn't surprise us, that's what they believe. Here is the beautiful organ there in the temple. I mean, um, the, the Mormon choir is noted for their absolutely exquisite music. And um, is, it is really beautiful, actually. Here is uh, inside, it's just, everything is marble. It's a beautiful structure to look at. Some of the Mormon doctrine, just to make sure, we don't want to, we want to make sure that, you know, what we're saying is true. So let's take a look at some Mormon doctrine. This is from Doctrine of the Covenants, verse 11. Mormon teach that Adam was God. Um, as a Bible-believing Christian, I can't believe that because we, Adam was made in the image of God, but he was not God in the flesh, right? That some sins are atoned for by own blood only. Now, these are all official writings from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So there are some, some sins, according to Mormonism, that you can't come to God, you can't come to God through Jesus and just ask Him to forgive you for. You actually have to shed your own blood to be forgiven for them. That's a very sad system, isn't it? I mean, God, if you read your Bible correctly in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? So Jesus can forgive us for every single sin. We don't have to cut ourselves. That's, that kind of reminds me of what they did back in the... Uh, uh, Mount Carmel time, where when as, uh, Elijah was up there and all the priests of Baal were cutting themselves with stones. Maybe you remember reading that story in the Bible. Another statement here, Jesus was born in Jerusalem. That's what the Book of Mormon says. That's, that's not true, is it? No. Another statement, Christ was married to Mary, Martha, and others. Well, that makes it very convenient for them to be married to, you know, whoever they want to be married to. They deny the atonement. One of the most pernicious doctrines ever advocated by man is the doctrine of justification by faith alone, which has entered into the hearts of millions since the days of the so-called Reformation. Seems that uh, Joseph Smith did not really like the Reformation, and it seems as if he didn't like the doctrine of justification by faith alone, which, which is really the hope of the Christian life, isn't it? that we are not saved by what we do, but we're saved by Jesus Christ and what He did for us alone. But they say it's a terrible thing, a pernicious doctrine. 
Adam fell. Notice this next one. This one's really bo bothersome to me. Adam fell that men might be and men are that they might have joy. So in other words, the fall of Adam was a benefit to us. Because of Adam's sin, we can have a better life. That's, 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 the, that's the doctrine. And it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, some friends of mine, we were in the Washington, D.C. area uh, a few years. Well, it's been about a year and a half, two years, I guess, now. But uh, we, we were doing some investigation there and um, some research, too. And then we came across this beautiful temple, Mormon temple. So we thought, hey, we're in the neighborhood, so we might as well stop in and see, you know, what's, what's going on at the temple there and see if we can get, you know, talk to some people or whatever. So we went to the temple, and there was a man dressed in completely white at, at, when you first went into the temple. And we just asked him, we said, yeah, we're just, you know, we're from, uh, I, was, I was from California at that time, and my friends were from here in Canada. And um, I say, hey, you know, we just like to take a look around, you know, show us around the temple, you know, see what's going on. And, and the young man, or actually it wasn't a young man, he was, a, he was an older man, but he said, um, I'm sorry, but, you know, you can't come in here. It's only for the, the holy people. You can't come in here. And, and I said, oh, okay, you know, but we, we just can't see it a little bit. We can't, you can't show us anything. He's like, no. But he said, but you can go to visitor center right next door, and there are some beautiful young ladies that will show you everything. And he was kind of, he said that kind of a strange way. And I was like, ooh, that's kind of creepy. But anyway, um, so we went to this visitor center and we met, there was these young missionary young ladies there and they were very kind and they were telling us some of their doctrines and they did say that absolutely that, that Adam's sin makes us more exalted. And uh, I just could not wrap my mind around that. And I still have a problem even attempting to do that. But, but that's official doctrine from uh, the Mormon church. So maybe you can bring that up to them next time they visit. I mean, you, of course, be nice to them. Some people are very rude to them. I don't want to advocate that because I think they're very good people. They just, they're just misguided in this teaching. Uh, Sterling Sill, member of the first quorum of the 70s, stated in the church section, Desert News, July 1965, under Christ, Adam yet stands as head. Adam fell, but he fell in the right direction. He fell toward the goal Adam fell, but he fell upward. Jesus says to us, come up higher. You see how they, they twist things? I mean, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty s scary, actually. The devil told the truth about the Godhead. I do not blame Mother Eve. I would not have had her miss eating, excuse me, I would not have her miss eating the forbidden fruit for anything. Through the gift of sin, humanity can achieve Godhood. Now, they normally don't tell you this when, you, when they first come to your door, do they? I mean, this is pretty serious. The gift of sin. Sin is a gift. Look what sin has done to this world. It's absolutely destroyed it. But they call it a gift of sin. You were also in the beginning with the Father. Man was also in the beginning with God. Intelligence or the light of truth was not created or made, neither indeed can be. So man is immortal. He's been from the beginning. Now, this really is kind of uh, <laughs> eye-opening to say the least. This is in the temple. This was um, in Utah. And uh, my good friend actually took this picture. And it is very interesting. This is the Howland family chart. Now, those of you who probably are aware that, that this, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is really big on genealogies, right? And, and checking out your family history and all that type of thing. Well, in the temple there, they have an interesting family tree and it consists of Joseph Smith, and Joseph Smith is, is there. But I'll show you another picture here in just a moment. But all the people you see there, all these diff are people with different names, and then there's famous people at the top, but they're all related to the gentleman all the way down here. And his last name was Howland. I, I couldn't see his first name there. But uh, it's interesting to see who these people are. Let's take a look and see who's related to this man. Uh, Joseph Ira Earl, some of you may know who he is. Joseph Smith, Emma Hale, Sir Winston Churchill, he's a pretty famous individual, right? Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Richard Milhouse Nixon, Leslie Lynch King Jr., but who is that? That's Gerald Ford, and George W. Bush, and also George H. W. Bush. They're all related to the same individual. Don't you find that kind of strange? It's very weird, isn't it? But the fact of the matter is, when you really understand how occultism works, is many times occultists are brought up in the same families. 
And they can all be traced to this man way down the line. And they're very proud about this fact. I mean, it, look at all these prominent people, right? It's very, very interesting. Not only that, but in order to go in space, well, not everyone that goes up in space, but I would say close to 75% or over, has to be either a Mormon or a Scottish Rite Freemason. Yeah. So it make, makes me wonder, in my own primitive mind, I wonder what's going on up there after all. You know, if they're, they're very secretive, what, what's going on up there? I mean, it's, anyway, it's just something to look into. But uh, all those men are, are, are Mormons and Fre Freemasons, at least 75% of them. Now, here is Gerald Ford, and he even signs his name in the lodge, Gerald Ford. Do you see that? 33rd degree Freemason. Those of you who came last night will be astounded by that, but that's how he signed his name. Um, here is the Scottish Rite calendar. Some of you may recognize this American uh, hero, uh, Benjamin Franklin. He was a Freemason. A lot of these Freemasons weren't high, high Freemasons, but a lot of them were. Um, but here are some interesting, do you know this man? He's a very famous American astronaut. Uh, Aldrin, if you want to watch an interesting video, <laughs> it's called Astronauts Gone Wild. If you want to watch that on YouTube, well, anyway, viewer discretion is advised. I'll just say that. Anyway, here's another um, picture of, of another astronaut, a very famous astronaut, who was a Freemason. So it's, it's, it's there. It's, it's out. If you, want to if you want to see these things, it's, it's there. But not only that, but in the lodge itself, the presidential gallery, most of the presidents of the United States of America have been Scottish Rite Freemasons, most of them. Um, there are a few who weren't. John F. Kennedy wasn't. Uh, Abraham Lincoln wasn't. And you see where it got them, right? Anyway, um, but there, are, there, are, there have been some that have not been, but there have quite, most have been Scottish Rite Freemasons. Here is their magazine, their old magazine, The New Age. I already showed you this before, but it was changed to a more politically correct title. Here are some of the books of Freemasonry, the one I already showed you, um, Blavatsky's works, The Secret Doctrine. So these are real books, and as scary as these things are, I'm not making them up. I wish I were, <laughs> but I'm not. Here is Alice A. Bailey. I remember we talked about her last night. Um, the Bible talks about consulting spirits, spiritists and mediums. It says, do not turn to mediums or spiritists. Do not seek them out to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. As it is pointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. But the New Age says we never die. We just keep living. We, just, we basically just get rid of the shell and we just keep living however. It doesn't matter what kind of life we live. We never die. But the Bible teaches something absolutely different. In fact, I have, to turn, I have to get you to turn with me just briefly to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me there. Ezekiel 18. I just want to really uh, solidify this point about the soul because this is very important. Ezekiel 18, and look with me at verse number 4. Ezekiel 18 and verse 4, and notice with me what the Bible says. It says, Behold, all souls are mine. This is God speaking through Ezekiel. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul, is, a soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, or sins, it shall die. So according to the Bible, do souls die? Yes or no? Can they die? Yes. The Bible says if, if the soul sins, the soul will die. But it, the New Age movement, as we have seen, says... You never die. You can just keep on living however you want. Here is the books by Alice A. Bailey under the publishing Lucius Trust, which used to be uh, Lucifer Trust. Um, some of the books that she has, Problems of Humanity, The Reappearance of the Christ. And every time you see that phrase, the Christ, be rest assured they're not talking about the Jesus Christ of the Bible. But they're talking about the New Age Christ, the Christ. There was a movie that came out, what was it called a few years ago? Uh, the Passion of the Christ. Maybe you, some of you saw that. Anyway, that's a, that's a very bad, hideous movie. I never saw it, but I never, from what I heard, I never wanted to see it. Forgetting the things that lie behind. This is Alice A. Bailey. I will strive toward my higher spiritual possibilities. I dedicate myself anew to the service of the coming one and will do all I can to prepare men's minds and hearts for that event. I have no other life intention. This is what Alice A. Bailey said. Now this coming one, again, is it the Jesus Christ of the Bible? Or is it the 
cosmic Christ. It's the cosmic Christ, the New Age Christ. Jehovah's Witnesses, we can't leave them out. This, they're very important. This is some of their books, The Divine Plan of the Ages. Um, there you have the symbol of Ra right there on the front. So, This is a uh, statement about Russell when he died. This was actually in his um, memoirs. And you're, you, if you don't believe me, there's the original cover of it, Zion's Watchtower. See what happens is a lot of the Watchtower um, publications are destroyed if they're not if they don't really come true, or if they're kind of information they don't want to be revealed. This is uh, the story of when Russell died. It's kind of a, it's hard to read, so I'll read it for you. I'll start from the top here. It says, I therefore sat on his bed while he lay before me. After several hours, his robe, to be rather, his robe proved to be rather inconvenient because his sheet and blanket could not be kept together. This was talking about when Russell was on his deathbed. He was sick. He was about to die. It was then that he stood again and said, Please make me a Roman toga. I did not understand him, what he meant, but he did not like to have him repeat because he was so weak. His voice had become so weak that he had to repeat, it, repeat nearly everything he said. I, had, I said to him several times, Dear Brother Russell, I do not like to ask you to repeat anything, but your voice is so weak that I can scarcely hear you. He would often, he would always repeat until at last the repetition would do no good, after which he made signs. Finally, the signs failed. I said, Brother Russell, I do not understand what you mean. He said, I will show you. He had me take a clean sheet and turn it down 12 inches from the top, and then a second one, the same, placing his left hand, and he goes on and on. Basically here, this is a, a picture of how high Freemasons want to be buried. They're buried in a Roman-type toga. So here, Russell gives instructions to have how he wants to be buried. So, anyway, then this is his grave today. It's uh, a pyramid with a capstone with the Masonic symbols on it. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear if you know what's going on. Now, the uh, Jehovah's Witness movement has had many, many predictions, many, many predictions that have proved not to come to pass. Here's just a few of them. Um, 1874, the coming of Christ. 1878, resurrection, they thought, but they then thought that they did, it did take place, but was an invisible resurrection. I don't know what good that would do, an invisible resurrection. Anyway, uh, 1881, close of favor to the Gentiles. 1914, Armageddon does not take place. 1915, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were not resurrected. 1918, Christendom and his churches were not destroyed. And you can just go on and on and on. 1975, the end of the world does not come. So there were many predictions that they had that absolutely did not come to pass. Concerning the time of the Gentiles, we consider it an established truth that the final end of the kingdoms of the world and the full establishment of the kingdom of God will be accomplished by the end of A.D. 1914. Next time a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, ask them about that and see if they can get that edition of the Watchtower. Probably, probably can't seem to find that one. Sometime before the end of 1914, the last member of the body of Christ will be glorified, and that did not happen. Here is what, what you're looking at here is a, uh, the headquarters of the, ch the Baha'i Church, the Baha'i Movement. And um, the Mount, this is actually placed, their, their headquarters is placed on Mount Carmel, which is the very, very same place where Elijah stood up against the, the, the myriads of the prophets of Baal and said, God and God alone, and he prayed in the... In, Elijah prayed in the, the sacrifice was consumed, but they couldn't do it. They were cutting themselves with stones. And... Elijah stood there and said, there's only one God. But it's interesting that today, that same place, the Baha'i faith has put their headquarters and said, it doesn't matter what you believe. Every God is any God is any God. It doesn't matter. And there it is. It's a, quite a magnificent structure. And um, let's take a look, just a small glimpse of what the Baha'i faith believes here. The fundamental unity of all religions. Number one, the independent investigation of truth, which is good. The equality of men, women, women and men, which is good. The elimina elimination of prejudice, which I agree with too, but their elimination of prejudice is a little bit different than what we would commonly think of. Universal education, the establishment of an international auxiliary language, spiritual solutions to economic problems, attainment of world peace through international cooperation, and then the, their founder, the Baha'u'llah, said, so powerful is the light of unity that it can illuminate the whole earth. Very interesting choice of words there. But anyway, 
The Baha'i faith wants to unify the whole world as far as religiously. Now it's interesting that the United Nations in New York City are actually in, in is headquartered there in New York City, but it's throughout the world also, of course, United Nations. But the United Nations, the most adherents of any church in the United Nations come from the Baha'i Church. That is where most of their people adhere to. Here are some of the other books. I just want to put this book on the screen, but just to let you know that the Star of David is not a nice symbol. This is uh, an interesting one. Some of you may be old enough to remember this movie called Hair. Um, some of you may remember this movie. This was a big movie about the New Age. Actually, it was, very, it was done in a very clandestine way, but it was, it was there. It says, when in, the moon is in the seventh house and Jupiter aligns with Mars, then peace will guide the planet and love will steer the stars. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius, har harmony and understanding, sympathy and trust abounding, no more falsehood or division, golden living, dreams of visions, mystical crystal revelation, and the mind's true liberation. Aquarius, Aquarius, Aquarius. That was, that was a music part, a musical part in that movie, which was a musical anyway. So, you see this teaching? I mean, this thing was, it's been going on for a long time in many different ways. Some of the other books you'll see, uh, we don't want to look at them all, Pyramid, Power. Um, Deuteronomy says, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or uses divination, or observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, charmer, consulter with familiar spirits, a wizard, a necromancer. A necromancer is someone who speaks to the dead. And there's even television programs on today, if you can watch your television, that they have people talking to the dead. But you know what, friends? They're not really talking to the dead. You know who they're talking to? They're talking to demons. Because the Bible says that when you die, you're resting until Jesus comes. And we'll, we'll look at that at the end of the meeting tonight. So, it's pretty freaky. Another statement here by uh, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived in the book of Ecclesiastes, says, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love their hatred, their envy is now perished. Neither, they have, neither they have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So the Bible is very clear. The Bible says that when a person dies, they don't know anything. They're just sleeping, like a dreamless sleep. Jesus comes again. The Bible says He's going to awaken the dead, and then they will rise and meet Him in the air. That's what the Bible says, but not what the New Age movement says. Now, modern channel Jay-Z Knight She's, she was on all these infomercials in the 80s. She's, she speaks to many of her clients, which include Shirley MacLaine. Of course, she's, she's at the forefront, right? Everyone knows about Shirley MacLaine. Burt Reynolds, Clint Eastwood, Richard Chamberlain, and some of the other people that you may have recognized from the 1980s. There's a picture of her. Um, she, was, she's been, she was very well known for a time. I don't think she's on TV like she used to be. But anyway, this is what she said. She said, throughout history we have tried, actually, this is what the being said through her. Ramtha. Throughout history we have tried many different avenues to remind you of your greatness. This is Ramtha talking to us human beings. Your power and the foreverness of your life. We have been king, conqueror, crucified Christ, teacher, friend, philosopher. Anything that would permit knowledge to occur. At times we have intervened in your affairs to keep you from annihilating yourselves so that life here would continue to provide a playground for your experiences and an evolution and your evolution into joy. Wow, that's pretty sick, huh? So this being Ramtha is saying, we all crucified Christ, friend, philosopher, I've come to you in many different forms, and I just want you to come together and continue having a joyful experience and not disagree with each other. Now this book, has anyone ever heard of this book, by the way, A Course in Miracles? This book has recently become very, very, very popular especially those with those who watch daytime television. And I'll explain a little bit more as I proceed. But it was written by a lady named Helen Schumann. And it started because she started hearing an inaudible voice which dictated messages to her. This continued for seven years. So this voice starts speaking to her and she starts writing down everything this voice says. Well, who, what is this voice? What is it saying? Let's take a look and see what Helen said for herself. Three startling months preceded the actual writing, during which time Bill suggested that I write down the highly symbolic dreams and descriptions of the strange images that were coming to me. Although I had grown more accustomed to the 
unexpected by that time, I was still very surprised when I wrote, this is a course in miracles. That was my introduction to the voice. It made no sound, but seemed to be giving me a kind of rapid inner dictation, which I took down in a shorthand notebook. The writing was never automatic. It could be interrupted at any time and later picked up again. It made me very uncomfortable, but it never seriously occurred to me to stop. It seemed to be a special assignment I had somehow somewhere agreed to complete. So this, this voice comes to her and she starts writing everything. Now, we shouldn't immediately hate what she's writing. We should actually see what she's saying and see if it coincides with what the Bible says. She says, but why me? Because you wish to know the true me. You're willing to serve and have given me permission to enter your life. Over and over again I was told that because this is a free will planet, all of us must ask to receive the spiritual ones, must agree to cooperate, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, this is what this being or this, this voice says are about Jesus Christ. Listen to this. This, is, this should tell you really quickly who this being is, okay? There is no need for, you, for help to enter heaven, for you have never left. There is a, but there is a need for help beyond yourself as you are circumscribed by false beliefs by your, of your identity, which God alone is in reality. So basically, I don't want to read the whole thing, but she says that we have never left heaven. We're still here in heaven. I don't think we're in heaven, do you? Have you looked outside? Have you looked, turned on the news? And we're not, in, we're not in heaven. She says, there is no death, or this being says, there is no death because the Son of God is like His Father. Nothing you can do can change eternal love. Forget your dreams of sin and guilt and come with me instead to share the resurrection of God's Son and bring with you all those whom He has sent to you to care for as I care for you. It's, it's sad when, 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 the, when she says, forget your dreams of sin and guilt. Now, I, I'm not saying we should constantly beat ourselves down because we're sinful beings. I'm not saying that. But there is a purpose of guilt. Did you know that? There's a purpose of guilt. When we feel guilt, that should lead us to confess our sins and be cleansed by Jesus. But what she is saying, or this person, this being is saying, is sin or guilt is a terrible thing. Don't worry about guilt. Don't forget about it. And that's what a lot of pop psychology tries to do too. Just, just forget about guilt. Just try to get it out of you. Now, this is pretty, pretty frightening to me. Oprah and the New Age, and that's Oprah Winfrey. Uh, some of you may not be aware of this, but this has been a recent uh, revelation, if you will. Jesus Christ being reinvented, redefined, and blasphemed, and this false New Age Christ teaching is about to t make huge inroads into the world with the help of the queen of television talk shows, Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey, beginning January 1st, 2008, on her daily radio program will offer a year-long course on the New Age Christ in a lesson a day and completely cover the 365 lessons from the Course in Miracles workbook. So the very same workbook that we just talked about is the very same workbook that right now Oprah Winfrey is offering courses for all of her television viewing audience. And how many, do you think Oprah Winfrey has a pretty good um, influence in our world today? Absolutely. I mean, millions and millions of people watch her show every day. Listeners will be encouraged to buy A Course in Miracles for the year-long course and an audio version recited by Richard John Boy Walton Thomas. I get that's the, that's the, wow, that's pretty sad that even that guy is doing it now. Will be available on compact disc. Those who finish the course will have a wholly redefined spiritual mindset, a New Age worldview that includes the beliefs that there is no sin, no evil, or no devil. And wow, that's, that's pretty, pretty serious. Another statement here, same, same article. A Course in Miracle teaches its students to rethink everything they believe about God and life and bluntly states, this is a course in mind training and is dedicated to thought reversal. Oprah told her television audience that Williamson's book, A Course in Miracles, was one of her favorite books and that she had already bought a thousand copies and would be handing them out to everyone in her studio audience. Oprah's endorsement skyrocketed Williams' book to the top of the New York Times bestseller list. And, and it's true that anybody that comes on Oprah's show, remember the guy, what was his name, um, Dr., what's his name, Bob? No, Phil, was it Dr. Phil, right? When Dr. Phil first went on Oprah, no one knew who the guy was. But as soon as his, he came on Oprah, his book went straight to the top. 
And this is the exact thing that's happening now. A Course in Miracles is allegedly a new revelation from Jesus to help humanity work through these troubled times. This Jesus, who bears no doctrinal resemblance to the Bible's Jesus Christ, began delivering channeled teachings in 1965 to a Columbia University professor of medical psychology, Helen Schumann. We've already talked about her. One day, Schumann heard an inner voice stating, this is a course in miracles, please take notes. For seven years, she diligently took spiritual dictation from this voice that described himself as Jesus. Here are some of the quotes from this Jesus voice. There is no sin. A slain Christ has no meaning. The journey to the cross should be the last useless journey. And this is a book that Oprah Winfrey is advocating. Now, Oprah Winfrey grew up in a Baptist home. I'm not here to bash Oprah Winfrey because uh, I have a lot of respect for her, actually, because she's really, she's done a great thing in her life of bringing her, she really had a very humble beginning and really became very strong. But I do have odds to say against this teaching. This is sad because she has so much influence and many people will not even, they will not even realize that this is New Age doctrine. There may be good Christian people, right? And they may get into this and they might not even realize it. Um, and then they get swept up into it. It's very sad. Do not make the pathetic error of clinging to the old rugged cross. That's what this voice said. This isn't Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus Christ as such is but a symbol. It is a symbol that is safely used as a replacement for the many names of all the gods of which, to which you pray. The recognition of God is the reg recognition of yourself. The atonement is the final lesson man needs to learn, for it teaches him that never having sinned, he has no need of salvation. So then, she, then this book says you never sin. So this is very, very, very sad. Popular author Wayne Dyer told his PBS television audience that the brilliant writing of A Course in Miracles would produce more peace in the world. The Course in Miracles based book, Forgiveness, continues to be sold Hold on, maybe that's, a, maybe that's a misprint. What is that? Robert Schuller's Crystal Cathedral Bookstore. As Schuller prepares to host a January 17th to 19th, 2008 Rethink Conference at his Crystal Cathedral. Surely, surely Robert Schuller wouldn't be into this. Would he? Would Robert Schuller be endorsing a New Age teaching? Well, keep coming, friends. You'll be shocked at what we'll see in the next few evenings. Um, in fact, if you want to look at this even more, there is a short video on YouTube. Some of you who have the internet connection maybe watch YouTube sometimes. There is a video, if you type in, if you type in YouTube, the search portion, if you type in The Church of Oprah Exposed, there's about a seven, eight minute documentary that is done very well. It's very, very um, nicely done. It just takes statements for what she said herself and shows the influence that it's having. In fact, it is the fastest growing church right now in the world, this church. is done online through this teaching, The Course in Miracles. Friends, I believe Jesus must be coming soon. Don't you agree? These things are just becoming more and more rampant. Another very well-known group now that's gaining a lot of notoriety, especially through uh, big-name actors like Tom Cruise, right? Even uh, Will Smith. You know Will Smith, he's like the new big blockbuster, he used to be a rapper, um, now he's a big megastar. But he also now believes in the Scientology church, which is uh, spiritualism, and um, it's pretty sad. Anyway, I don't, should I even, yeah, I'll read a little bit of this. The keynote of the New World Religion is a divine approach. They even take a Bible verse and use it, I hate that, but they use a Bible verse, but they turn it around for their own um, Gain. It says, draw, me, draw near to him and he will draw near to you. That's what James 4 says, but they, they use it wrongly here. Is the injunction emanating in a new and clear tones from the hierarchy today. The great theme of the new world religion will be unifying of the great divine approaches. The task, notice this, the task ahead of the churches is to prepare humanity through organized and spiritual movements for the fifth imminent approach the method employed will be the scientific and intelligent use of the invocation and the evocation anyway. Just talking about how this, this New Age Christ, how this spiritual training that the people are doing is just paving the way for Him to appear. So Oprah's course, you could say, is the forerunner for the New Age Christ to appear on this planet. It's a pretty serious statement, but it's the truth. Now let's take a look briefly at New Age Doctrine versus Bible Doctrine. What are the differences? The Bible teaches that Jesus is the Son of God. 
New Age teaches Jesus is one of the masters. He's, he's just one in a long line of other uh, you know, masters. Right? Number two, the Bible teaches very clearly that we're saved by grace. Not with works, we're saved by grace and grace alone. The works will come, but that will be a consequence of our salva salvation experience. New Age teaches that we achieve Godhood through works. So if you want to become like God, if you want to be God yourself, just do a lot of good things for people all the time and then, you know, you'll be God. And um, there's a, such a subtle difference in this. Have you ever met anyone, I'll, I'll tell you a brief story, maybe I shouldn't tell you this, but anyway, I'll tell you anyway. Have you ever met an individual who, <laughs> who, um, who does things, who does things just for the fact of saying, uh, I've done this, I've done this, I've done that, I've done this. Like, spiritually speaking, they'll, they'll do things and they'll say, I, I memorized the whole book of Ephesians today, what did you do? Or something like that. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll say things in such a way that will kind of try to parade their righteousness before you. Has, has anyone ever met anyone like that? Is that a pleasant person to be around usually? Not really, right? Because they're always bragging about everything they've done, right? But there's another individual who's very quiet, very humble, who loves the Lord, who also does good works, but doesn't make it such a big deal and doesn't put it up in neon signs, right? Which person is more pleasant to be around? The person who's very humble, right? It's, they're, they're much more uh, easy to be around. But the New Age movement kind of teaches that, you know, if you do a lot of good things, then you're, you know, you're, you'll become God which is not true. The Bible teaches that Jesus is the only way salvation outside of oneself. Jesus is the only way of salvation. We can't save ourselves. New Age teaches you have to awake the Christ consciousness within. You have to save yourself ultimately. Number four, the Bible teaches Lucifer was a fallen angel and now has become the devil because of his choices. Actually, Lucifer wasn't always a fallen angel. Lucifer was a beautiful, sinless being until he chose to rebel against God. But he rebelled and became the devil, right? But the Bible, uh, the New Age movement teaches Lucifer is the true son of God. So everything is upside down in New Age teaching. It's just like Freemasonry. It's the same thing. The Bible says worship God. New Age says worship the creation. Worship, you know, the trees, whatever you want to worship, nature. The Bible says man was created. New Age says physical man evolved. Spiritual man has always existed. The Bible says God is not part of creation. New Age says God is part of creation. In other words, that, that uh, pantheism would teach that God is in every single element of nature. God is in, you know, that little ant walking on the ground. God is in, you know, the leaves, everything. But God isn't in that. He created it, but He's not in it. There's a, there's a difference there. We start worshiping nature then. Um, number eight, the Bible teaches the resurrection. New Age teaches reincarnation. Uh, New Age teaches that, you know, you just die and you come back and it's something else. But, but New Age hasn't, like, my, like a, one of our, our, note, our keynote speakers, he always says, he says, if, if reincarnation works, then it doesn't seem like it's working very well. It does it because for thousands of years, things are getting a lot worse. They're not getting better. Um, the Bible, the Word is truth. New Age says truth is within. And this is a very, very subtle form of New Age thinking that has crept into Christianity I have to explain just for a moment. Um, you know, there are certain churches, and I'm not out here bashing churches, but I just want to be plain with you. There are certain churches out there who will say, you know, don't worry so much about the Bible. Don't, don't, get, so, don't get so wrapped up in what the Bible says. Just, you know, it's good to know, you know, that Jesus loves you and, and that, you know, it's good to know that. But, you know, don't worry about things like doctrine, things like that. That's, that's not important. All you need to realize is that, is that the Spirit the Spirit within you, He will guide you, and He will tell you what's true and what's not. Friends, the Bible, this is very important, everything written in the Bible will always be in perfect harmony with what the Holy Spirit is leading you to do. They're not two different things. Some people say, well, the Holy Spirit told me not to read that book. Really? That's interesting. What, 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 not, I don't think it's really the Holy Spirit who's telling you not to read uh, this por portion of the Scriptures because it says, the Bible says it's all inspired by the Holy Spirit, right? Number 10, the Bible teaches us to wait for the second coming of Christ, which will be visible to all. His coming in glory is the blessed hope. The New Age teaches, wait for the Maitreya, who will assist with the establishment of a one world government, monetary system, and religion. So it's quite a difference. 
Number 11, the Bible tells us to turn away from sin. The New Age says, turn from ignorance. There is no sin. There is no sin. Just, you know, you're being ignorant if you talk about sin. There's no such thing as that. That's pretty hideous. Number 12, the Bible teaches that we can become Christ-like through sanctification. We can become like Jesus. But the New Age says you can become your own God. You can become God yourself. That's a big difference between the two, right? So, what about Mother Teresa? What? Mother Teresa? Surely you can't be talking about Mother Teresa. Well, everyone has to be talked about, huh? <laughs> Mother Teresa said, Oh, I hope I am converting. I don't mean what you think. If in coming face to face with God we accept Him in our lives, then we are converting. We become a better Hindu, a better Muslim, a better Catholic, a better whatever we are. She, makes, she clarifies the point um, later on by saying, what approach would I use? For me, naturally, it would be a Catholic one. For you, it may be Hindu. For someone else, Buddhist. According to one's conscience. What God is in your mind, you must accept. And uh, that, that, again, is not according to what the Bible says. Now, I want to balance that out by saying this, that I believe that God can save anyone throughout the world even people who have never heard the name of Jesus can be saved because there's, for example, let's say if you live in a remote village somewhere in, in, in Borneo which never has an opportunity to hear about Jesus Christ. You've never had an opportunity to hear about His love. you never heard an opportunity about Jesus. If you're true to what the light that you know, the Bible says in Acts 17.31 that in your ignorance God overlooks it, right? I believe that. I believe that there are people in the world, there will be people in heaven. In fact, the Bible says it in, in, in Zechariah, if I'm not mistaken. It says there will be people in heaven that will one day come to Jesus and say, what are these scars in your hands? They never even knew about Jesus, right? But, f but for the most part today, is the gospel accessible to pretty much everyone in the world today? I would say pretty much it is, through the internet, through satellite television. I mean, it is... I mean, pretty much, even like if you go to certain villages, you have a satellite dish on a hut, right? I mean, it's, it's everywhere. But what she is saying is saying, you know, you must accept the Hindu God. You must accept, you know, Christ isn't really that, that important. And anyway, it's very interesting. Anyway, a Catholic priest has Zen for Yin. Uh, there he is practicing Yin, or Zen, I should say. Um, here is um, the late Mother Teresa with the uh, Dalai Lama, and the Dalai Lama is an interesting gentleman also, and uh, he is um, known as His Holiness also, so he also is God, so if you ever need any, anything, just contact him. And it's interesting that the Dalai Lama, it's amazing, they've already found the next Lama, and there he is right there. So if, if you're wondering the next Lama, there, the younger one there, he will be the next one after this one. Uh, dies, he, the, the next one is already, he's already been mapped out there. So the Dalai Lama, of course, the leader pretty much of the Eastern religion, all the Eastern religions pretty much. And of course, um, behind the scenes, they're really pretty much the same. The late Pope and the present Pope, the same thing. It's, they're, all, they're all on the same level. Path to Nirvana, um, Paradise Promise, many things they would do to enter Paradise. This is an interesting lady. This, this is known as the Hugging Saint. Um, this lady, her name is uh, Amrita Anada Maya. She's known as Ama. And um, I've met several people in my goings that have actually hugged her and talked about the incredible feelings that they received when they hugged this lady. In fact, the very town that we live in, the very small town we just moved to, um, we, were, we were walking around. I needed to get my hair cut. And um, there was a lady at a boutique, and um, she just came and she just asked me, she goes, what do you do? And I said, well, I, I'm, I go around and talk about the Bible. I teach the Bible. And she, she said, have you ever heard of uh, Amma? And, and she started telling me about the blessings she received by hugging her. And, I, and it, you know, there was a time and place for everything, right? I didn't tell her, oh, that's, you're, a, you're apostate or anything. You know? I just listened to her, right? Just listened to her and, 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 and you know. But it's amazing that, um, that people have turned to, to, to things like hugging o other individuals to receive this feeling, uh, this emotion. And it's really sad, isn't it? I mean, all they have to do is go to the Bible, ask Jesus in a normal, you don't have to be a theologian to pray. You can just ask Jesus in your own language, say, hey, Lord, 
I don't understand, or not, hey, Lord, but, Lord, I don't understand this. Please help me. You know, I don't understand what I'm reading. Help me to understand. And He will help. He will give you guidance. Um, of course, we do it with reverence, but, um, you know, and, and many people go to this lady. Now, she is a very powerful lady. Um, she gives big addresses at the United Nations, and this is what she said at one address she gave. She says, there is one truth that shines through all of creation. Rivers, mountains, plants, animals, the sun, the moon, the stars, you and I are all expression of this one reality. This is called pantheism, right? Everything is, you know. <coughs> it is by assimilating this truth in our lives and thus gaining a deeper understanding that we can discover the inherent beauty in this diversity. When we work together as a global family, not merely belonging to a particular race, religion, or nation, peace and happiness will once again prevail on this earth, which is drenched with the tears of of division and conflict. So the problem is, is with different religions. We need to just have one religion and everything will be peaceful, right? That's what they say. But if you read the Bible correctly, in 1 Thessalonians it says, when they say peace and safety, then will sudden destruction come upon them and they shall not escape. So this is all a lie. Here is a God-man. He doesn't look like God to me. He looks like he needs to go on uh, some kind of exercise program. But um, this is... Um, Many of the Bobs, many of the, these, all, all these people claim to be God. Um, it's amazing, all these gods we have running around. This is interesting, I just threw this in here. This is the Jesuit Swamis. Jesuit Swamis adopt the dress, diet, and the customs of the local uh, Lingiats of Belgium district to work with them more effectively. So that's an interesting way they go about converting them. They dress like them. Here is, uh, this is a very famous man. Um, many of you are probably aware of him, very, very, probably remember him very well. I remember him, uh, the Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, who used to be in this area, right, in the Pacific Northwest. And um, he was very, very influential. He had a lot of nice cars. I guess when you become God, you get to, you know, get a lot of Rolls Royces and a lot of nice vehicles. Um, a lot of people actually believed he was God and, and followed him. And that, that to me is the saddest thing. I mean, how can you, how can you believe it? But a lot of people, they, came from, they, they would come from families who were broken, who needed someone out there to, to love them, and he fit that mold perfectly. Uh, Ken Wilber, a New Age psychologist, says, By eating from the tree of knowledge, not only did men and women realize their already mortal and finite state, they realized they had to leave Eden subconscious and begin the actual life of true self. So they did not get thrown out of the Garden of Eden. They grew up and they walked out. That's what he says. This is the book, The Coming of the Cosmic Christ, written by Matthew Fox, and he basically says, let me just read the first part, I'm not going to read the whole statement, but he says, if my thesis is correct, that it is the time to move from the quest for the historical Jesus to the quest for the cosmic Christ, this would help to diffuse the distorted religion and pseudo-mystical movement of our time, properly known as fundamentalism and sometimes called Christofascism. So, Mr. Fox does not look highly upon people actually saying, this is truth, walk in it. Because when you say that, you're a very, you're a high annoyance to anyone who is open-minded. Because here, the historical Jesus must be thrown away, which is the biblical Jesus, and the cosmic Christ must be lifted up to make everyone love each other and go happily off into the sunset. This cosmic Christ will make things happen, will affect a change of heart, a change of culture, a change of ways, and so forth. We don't have to read the rest of it. Very interesting uh, books here, the Harry Potter series, which is actually teaching the, the, the wonders and the, the, the great things of witchcraft to our children. And they're actually being endorsed by Christian teachers. Uh, in fact, notice this statement. This is from Christianity Today. One of the most qu quoted supporters of the Potter books is Christianity Today, Charles Colson who in November 2nd Breakpoint radio broadcast noted that Harry and his friends developed courage, loyalty, and a willingness to sacrifice for one another, even at the risk of their lives, not a bad lessons in a self-centered world. But I'm sure Mr. Colson is not aware that a lot of those names in that very uh, book there are actual names of literal demons that have already been talked about by occultists. So, might want to get rid of those books if you have them at home. Benjamin Cream, he is the channel of the Maitreya, the coming world teacher. There is a video, but I didn't put it up there because his, his voice is highly annoying. Um, but uh, Benjamin Cream is an esoteric philosophy. He is the, the channel of the Maitreya, which he calls uh, the messenger of hope. And um, he talks about 
this down here it says revitalized Christian churches as well as Masonic lodges will be used for purposes of giving mass <coughs> planetary initiations when the new Christ arrives. What would you think what would happen? This is kind of incidental, but what would you think if, if um, let's say one day you, you get off work and you're going home and you're tired and you decided to watch the evening news and, and the evening news comes on and the, the reporter gets there and he says, you know, we're getting some breaking news coming out of, uh, of Moscow. We're going to go to Moscow live. So they go to Moscow and they, they see some strange ship coming down and a being coming out of the ship and saying he is the Christ. Now you might think that's, that's kind of crazy. That would never happen. I'm not saying it is going to happen, but I'm saying it would be interesting if it did happen because everyone is looking for a, a, a Messiah, a Christ to come to unify all the world's uh, problems. And it's interesting that he talks about giving mass planetary initiations because if you notice in the media in the last 25 years, even longer, 50 years, they have been really putting to the front about visiting visitors from alien worlds and things like that. I mean, it's definitely people have put it in the uh, forefront uh, in the media. So I would not be surprised if one day something like that would happen because um, that would really deceive a lot of people. Here is uh, some books by Cream, uh, Transmission of Meditation for the New Age, The Reappearance of the Christ. All of these books, you know, Maitreya's Mission, Volume 2, he has so many volumes of this. And then he says, have you anything to say about the Holy Father in Rome? This was in 1977, uh, quite a few years ago, but he said, the Master Jesus will take over the throne of St. Peter in Rome and the true apostolic secession will begin. This event is now imminent following the declaration of the Christ. So if it was imminent in 1977, then it must be even more imminent today, right? I think we're very close to seeing something, some miracles take place to, to do this. Now what does Maitreya say? He wants peace, he wants a system of sharing, removal of guilt and fear, education of mankind and the laws of life and love, introduction to the mysteries, beautification of all cities, the removal of barriers to travel and interchange of people, the creation of a pool of knowledge accessible to all, and uh, actually that one pretty much is pretty already done. The internet does a pretty good job of that one. An adequate supply of the right food for everyone. This is actually very interesting. Do you know some of the biggest proponents of, of ending world hunger are rock stars, like Bono for example? He wants to end world hunger. And I believe we should end world hunger, but the, the, in order to do this, you have to have a fascist system set up, which is being planned. And we don't have to read them all. The time has come to begin the process of change to transform the life of men in such a way that God in man shines forth. This, my friends, is not difficult to accomplish, for within you all sits such a divine being. My task will be to evoke from you that shining light. This is this Maitreya. So, Theology is usually useless. An argument over scripture is wasteful energy. Simply take the theme of loving and live it. So another thing that is really very, is pushed very much is this, is just a theme of loving. Now, as Christians, should Christians be loving people? Yes or no? Yes, absolutely. We should be the most loving people on earth, shouldn't we? Yes. But to talk about love all the time kind of cheapens love, I think. And if you go to any church today, well, not any church, but most churches today, you will hardly ever hear anything like you're hearing here this evening. Did you know that? I mean, you will hardly ever hear it. But what you will probably hear 98% of the time is how we should love each other. And if you love each other, that means that you should not, you should not get so dogmatic about, I mean, you know, Jesus was a good man, but there was also other good religions. I mean, come on, be more open-minded. I mean, you know, love other people, right? And it, it's done in such a way that it seems to indicate that if you say anything against anything other religious body, then you're unloving or you're judgmental, you're critical. Friends, I, the reason I personally do this is not to make people mad. The reason I make this, the reason I do this is for other people to know what's going on because mostly we're all, we don't know what's happening in the world. And I think that's a, I think that's a pretty loving thing to do, right? If, if people are in danger, you need to tell them. If you cling to every phrase of the Bible and argue its interpretation, you miss the point of God's message. Simply accept its basic tenet that you have a creator, a powerful force who has a plan for you. 
your return home in love and forgiveness. Accept this promise. Live it. Enjoy the full measure of its healing. Follow, following this plan is your function here. A powerful force. That's an interesting use of words there. Powerful force. I remember my first movie I ever watched when I was young was in 1977. It was called Star Wars. And in that movie, they said, that, may the force be with you. Remember that? Those of you who watched that movie? And that, that was a really good way to introduce New Age into modern uh, North America and the world. Those who believe what I am talking about should affirm the fact of the Christ, of the world teacher. And he um, goes on, affirm the fact of the hierarchy and the fact of the imminent reappearance in the world of the Christ and the hierarchy. If we believe it, this is what we should do because there is a very tight time schedule involved in this preparation work. The time between now and the reappearance of the Christ is very short indeed. And I don't have to read the rest of you, but re read the rest of it, but basically it's saying we need to be ready. And I think um, this movement that Oprah has started is very is very uh, on its way to, to help this New Age agenda. Now who is this New Age Christ? I invite you just for, as we bring this thing to a close in just a moment, I invite you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians 11, 14. Who is this New Age Christ after all? Who is it really? Turn with me there. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 14. And no marvel, or don't be surprised, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. You see, a lot, many of us think that the devil is some hideous looking being, right? We think he's, you know, freaky looking and all this and that, but the devil is beautiful. He's, he looks like he's an angel, really. The devil is a fallen angel and he's beautiful. And do you think, friends, if you, like I said the other night, if you were the devil, you would make it look so good that even the Christians would be deceived, wouldn't you? And Jesus said that, he said that even if it's possible, the very elect will be deceived. So I want to tell you, friends, when this New Age Christ comes on the scene, please don't go and see Him, okay? Be f steadfast with Jesus Christ. Now, what does the Bible say about the second coming of Jesus? Now, this normally is a whole lecture, but I just summarized it with a few verses. And this is what the Bible says about the second coming. We'll talk about it a little bit more in the future, but I'll just do it tonight for, for, because we talked about the false coming of the Christ. We'll look at the real Christ now. The Bible says when Jesus comes, He's coming with power and great glory. You'll find these references. Matthew 24, verse 30 and 31. Matthew 25, 31. Mark 8, 38. Luke 21, 27. When Jesus comes, friends, it's not going to be a secretive affair. There's nothing going to be secret about it. It is going to be the loudest. It's going to be louder than me, even. Much louder. <laughs> it's going to be so loud that CNN will not have to report to you that Jesus has come. You won't have, you will know it. It doesn't matter what corner of the globe you are in. If you are in, if you are in Madagascar, if you are in Iceland, if you are in the tip of Chile, wherever you are in the world, you will know that Jesus has come. He will come with power and great glory. Number two, Jesus will be coming with the clouds of heaven. This is very important. Jesus' feet will never touch the earth when He comes a second time. The Bible says that we will meet Him as you take a look at those references, that we will meet Him in the air when He comes. So this is very important. So if you ever see a being, or you don't even want to see this being, you don't even want to look at it because it's so, it will look so good. But if there's ever a being that says that it's Christ and He is on earth, then that's not the real Jesus Christ. Jesus' second coming is coming from the sky. Okay, number three, what is He coming for? He's going to punish those who refuse to know God. This doesn't mean He's coming to just punish those who, who never had an opportunity, but He is going to punish those that re persistently rebelled against Him. He has to put an end to the, to the problem, and that's what will happen. And the best reason why is He's coming to redeem us, God's people. If you can't get all these down, don't worry. We're going to discuss it at our last meeting. Jesus is going to come with the angels, the Bible says. In fact, the Bible says that heaven will be emptied for a space of half an hour. Can you imagine every single angel coming with Jesus? That cannot be a secret. I mean, that's not going to be a secret event. That's going to be an amazing event. Everyone's going to see Jesus come. He's going to come like lightning that shines from the east to the west. Again, everyone will see. Matthew 24 and verse 27. Also, very interesting. Revelation 1 says, says, 
every eye will see Jesus Christ come. Every single person. Some people sometimes they ask, they say, well, how is that possible? If you're living on one side of the world and Jesus is coming on the other side of the world, how is it possible that you're going to see him? I don't know. Maybe he's going to circle around the globe for everyone to see him once. That could be a possibility. I don't know. But I know this, that the Bible says it's going to happen, so I believe it. I trust what God says in his word. The resurrection of the righteous will take place. Matthew 24, verse 31, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 1 Thessalonians 4 says that when Jesus comes, the righteous will be brought forth and they will be given immortality at that time. So that's very good news to me because I, I have a grandmother, or I had a grandmother, who was a very faithful Baptist Christian. And um, she was probably, maybe the reason I'm a Christian today is because, probably because she prayed for me right before she died. I, I don't know, but it's probably the reason. Um, but she lived to everything she knew to be true. And um, I know I'll see her again in heaven. I just know it because she was such a good woman and such a committed Christian. And, you know, when I was uh, in my rebellious years there um, as a teenager, I remember thinking, you know, I don't believe in God and God is for idiots, you know, the people that have no brain. And, and, but I used to think about my grandmother sometimes, you know, I'd be like, wow, if, if, if it is real, then grandma's looking down on me right now. And I used to think, well, if she's looking down on me and she's in heaven right now, when I'm smoking all this marijuana, it must make her sad, you know? And then I began to think, you know, if, if she's looking on me now and she's in heaven, a, a state of joy, then that must be really torture for her to see me going to be this rebellious, right? And as I studied the Bible, and you can see it in that lecture if you wish, I came to discover that the Bible way is the way that makes more sense. The Bible says that when a righteous person dies, they die resting, and when Jesus comes, they won't even, they won't even it'll be just like, a, just wake up and have a new body, never subject to death anymore, never subject to any pain. If you have any questions about that, please, I'll be more than happy to talk to you. It's a very interesting subject. So, this is what the Bible says. When Jesus comes, it's going to be coming from the sky. All eyes will see Him. And I don't know about you, but I, I'm getting more and more tired of the news and seeing what's happening in our world. And I kind of concur with what the Revelator, John the Revelator, said in Revelation 22, verse 20. He said, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. I really want Jesus to come because... Um, this world is getting worse. It's going to get worse before Jesus comes. But when Jesus comes, we won't have to worry about it anymore. And the worst trials we have on this earth will not even come to mind. It, heaven will be so wonderful. This is ADTV, brought to you by Amazing Discoveries.